What's up, family? Welcome to episode 10 of the Chip Off the Old Block podcast. Hey, y'all. What's up? Old Block still present. Thankful, grateful, happy to be here. Hey, we made it to double digits, episode 10. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm going to have to tell your mother I'm following through. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, they ain't going to get nothing fixed at the house or nothing like that. But I am following through on the podcast. <laughs> hey, I've been making a little prog- a little progress at home. But uh, follow through game coming along. But no, it's definitely a blessing to reach um, episode 10. Um, hopefully, you know, this thing just keeps going, keep growing, and, you know, keep getting better. Um, but it's a lot going on. And where else could we start? But R.I.P. Brianna Taylor. Mm. Wow. You know, as we've um, not walked, uh, because knowing the pain of having someone brutally murdered in your life, um, no one can walk with them. Uh, So I would have to say those who have walked alongside of them, um, this is just another example of the criminal, um, United States criminal just kill black people system. And if it's police, okay. If it's policy, okay. If it's presidents, okay. Um, just another blatant example of how it fails families over and over and over again. Um, no one should go to sleep at night with the hope of awakening in the morning to go to work or do whatever their life joys or challenges sets before them and wake up in heaven because someone egregiously made some assumptions, judgments, and errors. And because of their disregard for black human life, killed that young lady. Yeah. And, I mean, that's the sad reality. Like, literally, we are at a place where, and not not to make this by myself, but it's just a fact. I'm riding down the street the other day, and the mere sight of a police officer makes you think, like, oh, do I got on my seatbelt? Because if I don't, if I get pulled over for that, it could lead to, you know. Death. And, you know, as it relates to, you know, this 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 specific case, um, as a black man, you know, I'm extremely upset, hurt angry and as an American embarrassed totally 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 um people wondered why it took so long now we know why (laughs) the rhetoric needed the science needed um, everything they needed as well as to hopefully allow the national protest to die down, just all of those things, we now know why it took so long because they knew from day one that no-knock warrant was going to qualify the behavior of those murderers. Mm, yeah. They knew that based upon policy, that protects the negative behavior, the vicious behavior, the murderous behavior of so many of these incidents that they knew from the beginning where they were going to end. And no one can ever make me believe that given what we have available to us today, both science, technology, procedure, and practice and experience, that it took this long to hear the crap we heard the other day. Yeah. Not not at all. And especially from the crap mouth we had to hear it from. Right. Not attacking him as an individual, but he's in that position, and the crap came out of his mouth. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, they're they're in 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 the wake of everything that's been going on and the announcement, um, as well as we know, um, what happened with the civil case, um, a week or two, you know, within the past couple of weeks, um, it's something that I wanted to to. Uh, address and I wanted to wanted you to uh, get your take on it and you to speak to it because there's a a narrative that's out there that I continue to to read from people and continue to hear from people um, about this and it's totally um, <laughs> misguided and you know to the family um, I believe it's a slap in the face and is is really based um, on ignorance and that is basically um, what I what I hear people saying is well. They took the money, so basically they were saying that that's that's okay. That's the justice that they were seeking. And clearly, what these people don't understand is um, the civil suit and the criminal case are two totally different issues. And basically, the the assumption or the the what what they're saying basically is that the civil suit has some bearing on the criminal case. Right. And it's a either either or type of thing. Wow. And that's so tragic and unfortunate, but it's easy for us to frame a narrative even here on this podcast because we're not them. Right. We're not that family. Right. But here's what I know, the the I believe that the civil suit does have does have some bearing on the case. I believe that they paid it this quickly because they knew exactly what they were going to do. Not the family knew anything. Not the family were in a bad position, but I believe that that, because they fight a long time to pay those those civil suits like that. Mm -hmm. So I believe they paid it early so that narrative could exist. Right. That they prejudged, preplanned every step along the way to see how can we minimize damage. Right. And maximize the fact that we're probably going to have to pay anyway because of our negligence, because of their murderous behavior. We're going to have to pay. So let's get it done now so that we can impact. Because for some people, all right, the moment that check was written, wired, or whatever happened, even if it has already been allocated, that then settled it for them. Right. And, yeah, I I, I agree, but... At the same time, I feel like it's totally irresponsible and disrespectful to to make that assumption about the family and the t- the to, to put the blame on them. That's this. The tragedy of that is, I believe that speaks to the individual jealousy. Yeah. All right. Um, from other people's perspective, what we paid you, shut up. How dare you? You know, just all of those things that 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 somehow plays out in the narrative from our lives. Um, and the tragedy is, is that that family, as many families over time, and many families on a regular basis who receive civil suit um, restitution, well, that's a bad word to use, but receive compensation in a civil suit, um, it goes on every day because of bad behavior of people in places. Right. All right. We hear about the larger cases, mm-hmm. but taxpayers are paying for their bad behavior, and then people are standing behind that bad behavior as if it's warranted, merited, necessary, especially when it comes to us. And they literally have no regard because of what? Immunity. Right. All right. That's where it came from. Right. It had nothing to do with the specific act, but it was to keep them from having to be responsible for that payment. All right? Mm-hmm. But now it has filtered into a philosophy where this immunity now has broadened into the act and the behavior itself and no accountability. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's when I when I listen to people who have a specific um not have a knowledge in this specific um, area because so many of us don't know anything about the law, but we got a mouth, so we got an opinion. <laughs> um, that that's qualified immunity. That's one of the specific things where change can be made 
Um, and you know, I'm I'm not a a, a, a lawmaker, a legislature, legislator, anything like that. But one one specific thing that I heard um, in regards to policy is this idea of uh, police officers needing to have their own insurance policy, kind of like doctors and, and those kinds of things. Whereas then things are you know it'll be a little bit different. Oh, see, <laughs> this is why accountability becomes important in the fight against accountability. Right. Because now if you take my pension based on my behavior, oh no. If, as you say, I've got this insurance, see, these are things unrelated to my behavior. These are things related to their behavior that they're fighting against any accountability. Come on now. If we, if we don't have accountability, we see what happens. Right. I mean, we're seeing it every day right now with the virus coming out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, accountability. That, that, that's what we're asking for. Absolutely. Accountability. Accountability. To another thing. And you saw it in the Madden Lee statement. Mm -hmm. Thugs. That young lady wasn't no thug. He felt justified from everything that happened when they went in that house. He wrote a narrative. It was out Monday or Tuesday. And that's the attitude. See, he said the attitude. Oh, police, only 1%, this percent is good or bad. No, he said the cultural norms of what they think. Right. See, I heard this, and, and I've tried to find that clip. When Mr. Floyd was first murdered, um, one of the sheriffs, he may have been the, the, the head sheriff in that city, said, if we could only see each other as humans. And that's been the issue in this country since we wrote the Constitution. Now, as you stated to me many times, the Constitution is an economic document. 100%. All right. And we know that. And antiquated. <laughs> okay, an antiquated economic document. Okay? All right? And for the purpose of economy and the purpose of inclusion and exclusion, we were declared three-fifths human. Couldn't own property, couldn't vote, so on and so forth. At least white women... Eventually, they gained certain rights, but they were not declared. But they had to be married in order to get op access to opportunity. Right. Okay? And so that designation, that expression is lived out every day. So, so, so let's say, let's say, for the sake of, I hate for this to even come out of my mouth. Please, audience, understand. I'm not stating this as a belief, a fact, or something I even think. But just for this discussion... Just say there was no racism. Mm -hmm. If we're only three-fifths human, then what? Doesn't matter how we're treated. Right. All right? Why would I let a person who's only three-fifths human vote? Why would I care about infant mortality and education and poverty and hunger and health care, access to health care? Why would I care about those things for those three-fifths people? Right. Right. And and that that train of thought, that line of thinking is is continuing to be just put on display across the board. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about the CEO of uh, what was it? Wells Fargo about basically not being able to find talented black people where there's a limited pool of talented black people. Right. And that that's that same thought process. That's that same mindset in my mind anyway. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, um, having had the privilege to live um, in this country because I am a I have to be careful. I'm a preacher, right? I think so. Can you cuss on podcasts? Uh, 100%. Oh, okay. Oh, man, shoot. 
Man, this is not church, this podcast. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> See, I don't cuss in real life like some preachers, okay? Now, I'm not hating on them, but I don't. All right? Okay, but I do cuss in my sermons. Right. Because over the years, people be sleeping. I say one of them words, they be like, what did he say? <laughs> they wake up. So I always use them as attention getters. All right? But I am an American. And this country don't belong to them. Right. It doesn't. They did not work 400 years for free to build it. Now, they benefited significantly, but I'm as much American as anybody in the White House. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm as much American. All right, so let's not let anyone take that from us. Right. All right, we are... Americans. All right, now we got to fight. Yeah. And and I'm I'm glad you bring that up because it can be very draining to be a black American. Right? right. Um and it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster as things like and I and I hate to even say it like this but things like this play out. Um and and you you spoke of the the timing and the amount of time and how perhaps the civil suit coming so quickly was a strategy and perhaps this even coming out when it did was a strategy to demoralize us as we get closer to election day but let us not take this you know situation as something to make us lay down as if oh well it doesn't matter because anything's not going to change but if anything this should make us fight even harder this should make us come out even stronger to vote now i'm certainly not um suggesting that you know um joe biden being elected president will stop police from killing black people but us being engaged in the process we can we do have the voice and the power and the ability to affect the specific policy that needs to be changed so that when police do kill black people, they're held accountable. Absolutely. And, and you guys, um, I, I, I like the idea that the torch is being passed or has been passed or we're running together. Um, I think we're a good example of that here in ministry along with your mom. Uh, um, and, you know, I look at the LeBrons and, and, and um, uh, Osaka, the, the tennis player. Yeah, and, shout out to Naomi Osaka. That's <laughs> that's just uh, and, oh, and real quick, not not to, not to cut you off, but 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 both of the, like people like LeBron, people like Naomi. I, I'm really proud of that because it's like she's not shying away from it, but they're using that platform to shed light on what's really happening, and that is something so powerful to see. Right, and and and, and that's the joy. And, and so if I'm Simeon sitting in the, in the temple and I see Jesus walk in and I can say, Lord, my prayers have been answered because you've allowed me to see, I, I can say hallelujah. Right. Okay. Um, um, I'm not as old as some of my mentors and, and the people that brought me into activism when, 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 when I was involved early on, the Joe Lowry's, the Jesse Jackson's, the oldest Moss, Marvin McMichaels, and now Marvin's spoke closer to me. Um, um, and haven't had the privilege to be with them, Dick Gregory, on and on and on. Um, uh, and, and it was a joy. You know, I was a joy to them as I came along in my group. You know, here's Megan May, and all of us came along. You know, and I see you guys coming along, and I hear these things, and I see LeBron, you know, uh, and I was talking to Pastor Ron Hill the other day, and, you know, little Ronnie was out in California hanging out with LeBron, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they went to school together. And so, right. I mean, it's just really exciting. The battle is still there. And, and 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 we can you know see the movement in the Supreme Court and certainly we bless the family of of, of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the yeah, her absolutely. work and, and I remember the Clarence Thomas hearings you know and, and I'm saying to myself you cannot <laughs> you cannot replace a Clarence I mean a Thurgood Marshall with a Clarence Thomas. <laughs> No, please, God, no. And it happened. And you're about to see the same thing now uh, as you are, are, are growing in ministry and the potential view and what you're going to do in your family because he's going to replace this tremendous justice. Mm. Um, who And see, 
um, um, conservative and liberal is not what's relevant. What, what he's done is put justices on the bench who their jurors resume. <laughs> less than stellar. <laughs> not just less than stellar, but weak. No, that was... Uh, weak. Okay, and that's not to insult the Kavanaugh's and those people. Okay? But when we look at the people that were being put on the bench, conservative or liberal, over time, these people were... I mean, they, they, they had fought through the ranks. They had argued before the court. They had... They were people. They were, regardless of their philosophy, you had to respect no. their, yeah. inter- their, their, their legal intellect, not just the fact that they got A's in college. It's a, it's a standard of excellence. Yes, absolutely. The bar is being lowered. Absolutely. Well, it's the new standard, though. See, see that's what happens, though. In certain cases, you'll see now the bar is down here. Mm. Whereas the chairman of Wells Fargo, when it comes to one group of, group of people, wants to put the bar up here, which he didn't meet. <laughs> right. Yeah, he didn't get that position because of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I know some stuff about them. It's just not for the podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and it was all legal stuff, too. I mean, dealing with courts and stuff and some stuff they was doing. In early 2000. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, definitely RIP to the notorious RBG. Um, yeah. I laughed and I, and I said, oh, yeah, that's right. She was a notorious too. <laughs> right. You know, and uh, again, to her family and to the, all of the thousands and thousands of people, millions maybe, and certainly the thousands and thousands of women that she empowered to, to say, yeah, we can make a difference, and uh, and who will prayerfully take up uh, their mantle in light of her mantle, and uh, receive a double portion as mm. Elijah and Elisha did um, together. So, um, but that's that's my hope. And as I was listening to some of the some of the young ladies and some of the jurists and some of the lawyers speak um, over the last um, several days um, after her passing. I'm saying, wow, Lord, because the refreshing, I'm, I'm, I, the refreshing has to come from a plethora of all of us, right? You know, the conservatives are winning now. Well, I'm, I don't like it because I don't, I don't care for the fact that they only care for life in the womb, right? Okay? You know, okay, I'm out now. What about me? <laughs> okay, you know, I wish they had, and I've said this to my um, conservative friends, and I've said it to them for years. I just. You know, I just I can't get on board with y'all because y'all don't care about nobody. Y'all only care about me. You care about my soul, all right? You care about me in the womb, but the moment I'm born or born again, you don't have no holler for me. Leave my soul alone and leave me in the womb. So before I get here and after I'm gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you only care about me before I get here and, and I don't after care I'm what, gone. You know, any conservative person, color, black, white, it doesn't matter. That's not biblical. Right. It's not a biblical at all. But they've written these theologies and created these arguments that are non-biblical but are straight political arguments, pro-choice, pro-life, you know, all these things. And, and that's why I'm praying that you guys don't forget scholarship. Yeah. All right, James Cone, the late James Cone, who recently went home to be with the Lord, um, he could write black theology. He could write liberation theology because he did it according to their hermeneutical process. Mm. He followed the science. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. He just didn't create something. Right. All right. And that's why it's taught in everywhere but conservative schools in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at it briefly. Although I went to an evangelical conservative school that created a whole school and department uh, because of Dr. William H. Myers. So um, there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. And I hope that. Um, the current politics doesn't uh, create a sense of hopelessness or create more hopelessness for those people who are hopeless because there is hope. And a lot of times people look at somebody's life and say, yeah, well, uh, uh, you're, you're this or you're that. Uh-uh, stop that. There's hope for all of us. Yeah. But there's a grind for all of us. Right. All right. You got a grind based on hope. All right. You got to grind based on vision and what you see and what you want and what you desire. And then you got to understand when those barriers come, when racism rises up against you, it will. Right. But do I quit because of it? 
Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, do your bit and come on home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't keep fighting when you get tired. You can't keep fighting when you get hit. Well. You, you got you, you to gotta fight until you win. Got to fight till you win. And I, I'll go back and say this again. Um, and I'm going to say this to African Americans, blacks, one way. And I'm going to say this to the majority community in another way. Because I want you to see it every time somebody talks to me about some damn bootstraps. Um, I look them in the face and I say, you're full of crap. Okay? We're the only people in this country, and the Breonna Taylor verdict uh, just reinforces it in my mind and in my spirit. But we're the only group in this country that has to fight for liberation simultaneously while we're fighting for our survival needs. Everyone else, when their survival needs are met, freedom is theirs. Right. We can be surviving. Our survival needs can be met. But liberation is not there. See, the Emancipation Proclamation um, freed, you know, our ancestors constitutionally. Mm -hmm. And then they killed Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there has never been a time when the liberation of blacks, African Americans, I like to say coloreds and Negroes because of my grandfather and my father, where that liberation was fully actualized. Yeah. And and that's that's probably part of the problem because and not N not taken up for him at all, but f for some people, that's almost impossible to see. Nah. Hallelujah. No. Um, Based on their perspective. Oh, no, I understand. But then, if enough of us get to that place. I mean, it's, 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 it's painfully obvious to us. Right. Or right. maybe it's just the fact that they ignoring it. I don't know. Right. No. I wake up every morning knowing I got to fight for my future, the future of my children and grandchildren and my great-grandchildren I don't have yet and their children. I wake up every day knowing that. Right. And that's biblical. Right. And people don't understand that's biblical because th the scripture is clear that a good man right. leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, we can think that's just monetary. Mm-hmm. But in our case, it's monetary plus liberation. Right. So I've never had the privilege to lay down at night and not wake up the next day knowing I got to fight for liberation. Right. I never had that privilege. Yeah. All right. And for the people who don't and don't understand or don't know or aren't interested, that's their right. But those of us who understand and know, we're that army. Yeah. Well, it's because the American way. The American way is... Is just self. As long as I'm good, then it's all good. Well, I mean, and that, wow. It's amazing because um, one of our family members passed this morning, Michael Dinell, my brother. And uh, his brother and I were sitting there, and because you know your Uncle Jimmy passed. And we were just, we just went straight back to our childhood. <laughs> I mean, straight yeah. back, you know, and because uh, we lived a street apart in elementary and middle school. And uh, we were just talking, and, uh, you know, there was no such thing as homelessness. Because mm. everybody took somebody in. Right. And so he had taken his daughter when she graduated from college to uh, Nigeria, Egypt, several places over in Africa. And he was in this one place, because he's an architect, an engineer, and it was this one place where he was, and they didn't, they didn't really build out the top of the house, he said. And so he was like, after he saw several houses like that, he, he has somebody say, wait a minute, why don't you guys finish the top of the house and seal it? Right. And they said, that's for family. Mm. If family comes up, we build another level. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Different mindset. And and I know our family, because I used to call daddy and mommy the overground railroad. <laughs> and the amount of people who came to live with us, so we, it was just, we were just family. 
Yeah. I mean, we, we were, we've been the same way. <laughs> right. We just family, you know, and, um, and, and I always say this is that, um, the more American we become, I used to say this cause now I've seen, I see it differently. I used to say the more American we become, the less black we are. But now when I look today at the, at the culture of America, we have had a significant impact on the culture of America. Oh man. Fashion, music, entertainment, the way I'm listening to uh <laughs> uh, uh a, a group of uh, uh Caucasian female people talking. Um they were educators or whatever. And I'm hearing stuff to come out of our mouth and I'm like, "Wait a minute, you don't say that kind of stuff." <laughs> oh man, I'm trying to tell you the hip hop <laughs> culture alone alone is vastly the most influential thing yeah and it was always like that with our music always but, but i mean no 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 far beyond i'm saying the whole impact the of whole, it and the, the imprint culture. of it and yes. they'll profit off of it they'll exploit it but deep down inside they hate it well they hate the person too right but the problem is is it's so powerful that they gotta monetize that power <laughs> Right, And so I would say that, you know, your generation, our young people, and any of us who have still got a little less something left, you know, hey, come on, man. This ain't a time to take the gloves off. You know, if this dude get to court, get to court. If conservatives win, we got to go fight with them or join. I don't know. We got to do something. You know, it's not, there'll never be a time in America where there's no opportunity unless we allow it to happen. Oh, 100%. Tough, hard. And we will cry, we will bury our sisters, Breonna Taylor, we will bury our brothers, George Floyd, and in our case, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. <clears throat> we will bury our family members. We will, and that will, we will bury more. Um, because that spirit of the Confederacy, it is powerful in this country and has never given up hope to win the next civil war. And right now, the conservative movement represents the Confederacy. Mm. Oh, right to vote. That's Confederacy. Mm. Okay. All right. T attacking health care. That's Confederacy. Now, our friends who are conservative, and I got plenty of friends and preachers who are conservative, that's Confederacy. Wow. The root of it is the Confederacy. Right to vote. Access to uh, housing. Now health care. All of those things, they will tell you in a moment, we do not want big government, we do not want government to pay for it. But you let the banks get in trouble. Right. You let big business get in trouble. Right. All right. Talk to, you know, one of my providers and, well, CJ, you know, we don't want socialism. I don't want socialism either. But I don't want what we have. But I want us to understand that the benevolence of the body of Christ in this country can end racism and bless people's lives now if we were not divided by political bull. Yeah. The body of American Christianity historically, from the Ku Klux Klan before until now, is the biggest reason why racism is alive. We will stand when this is over in stadiums and cry about reconciliation while we still hurt, kill, and maim each other politically with policy. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy. The body of Christ wants reconciliation and unity, and John 17 realized in this country, then you are the conservatives. You now have the court. You are going to reverse Roe versus Wade. You are going to destroy the Affordable Care Act. Come up with something to bless people like Jesus would. Yeah. Quit crying to me about that crap Christianity y'all call what y'all have. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's on the money. Well, either you love the Lord or you don't, and you can't love the Lord without loving people. Right. 
that's kingdom and that's biblical. Pro choice, pro life, I don't know nothing about that. That's that's not kingdom. I don't have to I don't have time to do research and play those political games. All that's political rhetoric based upon the values of a group. Abortions of value, same sex marriage is a value, and more recently opiates became a value. And we saw the difference in treatment from law enforcement and everybody when opiates started to be an issue in communities versus crack. Yeah. We were criminalized for a disease, whereas an, a much stronger and a much more illegal drug is being what? Touted as and cried about, and, 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 and forgive me because any family, and I lost a family member years ago to uh, overdose, all right, who, who has lost a child or is losing children. We must fight against the opioid and the opioid crisis. But not to see that through the eyes of racism, all right, I will never not do. Mm. The hypocrisy. It, it, it is. It, it, it is so tragic because I can't believe, and I know so many um, conservative believers, evangelical Christians, which will redeem that word too now that they've thrown it under the bus or under Trump. Uh, uh, what evangelism, evangelicalism really is because they don't own it. Um, but um, it's so tragic because I can't believe, and I know they are, that they're that blind. Right. And that's what I was saying. Yeah. And unfortunately, you had a blind leading the blind. And great seminaries, great theologians, blind leading the blind. Mm. Because if, you, if, if those three issues are the only biblical issues that's important to God. I, I I don't know that God. Yeah, me neither. And I know I know Jesus Christ, and I know Jehovah the Father. Yeah. And I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, and I do bang the little bro show them they speak in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they like it or not. And I've earned a couple master's degrees and a doctor's degree from an evangelical seminary. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's real simple. <laughs> How do you treat people? It's never been complex for me. All right, I mean, I studied, I learned all this stuff you were supposed to learn because I want to be a good example to young people. I didn't want people to question me because of how I came into Christianity and how I came into the ministry because I didn't come from the pew. I came <laughs> from some other place. But uh, uh, So, you know, and my pastor was uh, highly educated, Morehouse, Oberlin Divinity School, went to school with Dr. Gardner Taylor, was one of our, you know, greatest uh, preachers in America, let alone just being a great African-American preacher. Uh, and so I was just always so humbled by his intellect and by just how much he he knew and how brilliant he was that it challenged me that, you know, hey, I got to study, study, study. It was really funny because, you know, uh, I spent the first 10 or 15 years of my ministry, 20 years, just in school and studying, you know, and I didn't participate <laughs> in a, you know, because <laughs> I wasn't there for y'all. But, uh, and, you know, because it was, I was just determined, I never wanted to be no, you know, it was funny when I came along because uh. if you were a scholar or intellect, you weren't a nerd in our community, but you got beat up. <laughs> okay. So I had to be, uh, you know, balance that thing. And so sports became my balance in that. Right. You know, so I didn't have to be called, uh, even though I took chemistry and calculus and all the classes. Me and Myron, A. Myron. Uh, of course, Frank got A's. I don't know what me and Myron got. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. how powerful is it if you're the best on the field and in the classroom? Just now, everywhere see, you go, that's you're the I one. That's where I tried to get you, all yeah. right, because that was my later revelation was that, wait a minute, what my mother was trying to get me to do, which would be the academic person, okay? Oh, no, no, no. That was one thing. <laughs> I, I, you know, no. I may not have done all my homework, but in that classroom, everybody <laughs> knew, like, oh, no, CJ, no. Charles, he, he knows what's going on. Yeah, well, I, I've always admired that about you because you were a scholar athlete. I remember Rich Rodriguez sitting in our living room uh, before they offered you from West Virginia, and it was really funny because, uh, you know, and, and, and um, he didn't understand he was being stereotypical. Um, and I didn't get insulted behind it, but he said, well, uh, you, you know, Pastor, all we got to do is get him through the clearinghouse. 
Like, get him through the clearinghouse. <laughs> you don't know my son. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you know, it comes from just kind of a grooming um, early on, things like the REACH program yeah. um, and those kind of things. I mean, you know, I don't know. I guess we just come from a place where excellence is expected in a sense. Right. And, you know, that's why it's like – um that's the kind of thing that I like to preach to young people. Yeah. Like excellence. Like um, we had a, um, we had a saying one year at uh, Kent, A players must get A's. And I felt like, oh yes, that's, that's right on the money because whatever it is that is your level of achievement, we can't accept anything lower. Absolutely. So if you a B student, that means you get a B every time. <laughs> if you a student, you get an A every time, but whatever it is, like there's no room for, less than but excellence maximizing what it is that you have and who it is that you are is is essential right and i i, I love that about all of y'all you know because all of you guys have been extremely good students and uh, graduated from college and um um and so that as a parent that gives me great pride um i'd like to think i had a little to do with it i know your mama had the most but <laughs> don't, don't tell her I said that audience don't tell, don't be oh man she gonna be listening to the podcast <laughs> anyway know, hey man. baby you had a lot to do with it but um you know and and, and 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 see my parents and see that's the difference my granddad okay born in 1898 didn't have a chance to go to school up until about the second or third grade I never knew that because mm. he helped me with my homework when I was a kid <laughs> I mean he did everything but he taught himself how to read Right, and he was determined that his kids got to go to college. So, and Ida and your grandmother got to go to college. Right. All right. Then they were determined to put that in us, mm -hmm. you know. And so, my grandmother would argue with you, and she was born like nineteen oh three or four. Hey, listen, I went to Spelman before the fire. <laughs> okay, and so I guess it was some big fire in the nineteen. Yeah, I always hear about this fire. <laughs> yeah. I don't know nothing about it's it. Spelman, but yeah, she made it a point. I went to Spelman, you know, and so that level of pride, that level of uh, interaction, and so today that becomes a part of the battle because the young person, the child who doesn't have that in their house, and that's not condemning or putting down their family, then that's where the church comes in. And, and, and I would say to the young activists and to all the different movements out there, they need to co connect back to, um, we need to partner together because this is the one institution that we own that can get it done. All right? Right. But they don't have all the same beliefs and all of those things, but, but we can work together on community. And yeah. building families and building lives. I remember um, Minister Richard Muhammad was here for years, and and, and uh, he was over the mosque, and he and I had be become friends. And uh, uh, he came to me one day, and he said, "You know, my brother, um, you don't have to do this." And uh, I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, you know, the minister's going around the country, and he's having these these things in our our big day. He wants to come to Cleveland, but we can't get a place." And see, he said, but I understand if you don't want to do it, I want, and won't, you know, and friends of Polari. I said, no, come on. Right. Because I believe that our hospitality is the first step in showing God's love to people. Love my neighbor as myself. Yeah. It's, it's a different side of that same coin that we was just talking about. Right. Because then the point becomes just like the lawyer in the case. Well, who is my neighbor? Right. No, be the neighbor. Right. It's like when I was away, I had a, um, a brother, friend, we used to walk together, and he was um, from Egypt, so he was Sunni, uh, I think. But anyway, he was from Egypt. And uh, one night we were sitting because his wife was having her baby, and he was on the phone and off the phone, and I prayed with, with him. And her for safe delivery because she has some complications. And he said, you know what, uh, Brother Charles, you, you have um, really shown me more love than I've ever experienced from a Christian. I said, you know, you don't understand. He said, what? I said, I have to love you more. He said, why? I said, because you as a non-believer, the one way I can win you is with my love if I can't win you with my rhetoric. Mm. <laughs> and 
as God would have it. Um, Cause I believe they were, he, he and his dad and brother were political prisoners as God would have it. He won his case and got immediate release. Wow. <laughs> We're all praying and believing God. All, all of us in our little circle who were believers, he, he was Muslim, uh, but we were praying, you know, uh, and he got he got this immediate release. So, you know, um, I show love. I'm, I'm, I'm tough. I'm hard. Okay. <laughs> 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 I don't make no bones about that. Okay, I was talking to Billy today, and that's Mike's brother. You know, we were talking about our dads, you know. And he said, I'm going to walk into the gate because that's what dad would do. And I say, yeah, isn't it amazing how much we are like our fathers? And he was like, man, come on. <laughs> you know, my, my father loved us as much as any, more than any love other than Christ's love you could experience. But he he played, he was, he was tough. <laughs> right. You know, and I guess, you know, that's that, that part of me. But my mom balanced it out, you know, and that was the good thing. You know, because uh, she never let him be too tough or too hard, and so she was the balance in the house. So we had both both ends of the of the spectrum, you know. But uh, I laughed because toward the end of his life, and as we, you know, both me and now um, talking, uh, we shared different stuff. You know, he would laugh at the stuff I would I would ask him about. You know, in the last I remember our last conversation because uh, that Sunday, my I think my had gone to the convention. I don't know if I went. Uh, but um, or the board meeting or something, and so we were sitting there talking, and uh, I had bought that that Forerunner. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I never bought a truck before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had the vans and stuff, and so he was laughing because you know I always drove whatever kind of cars they were, and so oh you bought a truck now? I said yeah, I'm trying to be like you, and he started he just bust out laughing and said okay. I never thought I'd see you in a truck, you know. Now, of course, you know, we've bought trucks, so many of them since he's passed. But um, uh, that was really funny because we had got to a place in our life where we were just, I don't want to say friends because I never could see him as a friend, but our conversation was just so powerful. Right. You know, and then after he passed, it it became more powerful and more valuable because uh, he had gone on to be with the Lord, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Browns won. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> you, know. you know what? I was I was thinking the other day uh, because, you know, week one to week two was so drastic. I compare b- being a Browns fan to being a golfer. <laughs> it's like you're so hopeful when you wake up in the morning. You're like, I'm going golfing day. You get that first tee. You're full of so much hope, so much expectation. This is going to be the day. And then you get out there. <laughs> but then every time something happens that will keep you coming back. Well, um, you know, I've been a Brown, Brown fan all my life. And uh, it, was, uh, it was exciting to see that game and uh, the game plan. Uh, cause you know, I'm hard on everybody cause I don't want Baker Makefield to turn out to be Mike Phipps. Okay. <laughs> you know, we stuck with somebody for a long period of time and we, and we're always on the brink, but we never get there. Cause that year, uh, I think it was 72 when Miami went undefeated, you know, the team that should have beat him and it's, it's still, it's in the history was the Cleveland Browns. Right. And what lost the game for us was the quarterback, Mike Phipps, five interceptions. Wow. Yeah. One was tipped, but he threw the other four to them. <laughs> You know, and plus we had traded Paul Warfield to Man. get that chump. I mean, um, Mr. Fist, forgive me. Hold on. Two. Uh, yeah. Two. Two. Miami. Miami. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to make the rest of the comments. They ain't never heard of no Bob Greasy to Paul Warfield went down there. Yeah. Of course, people will argue with me. But you know Michigan. Come on. But anyhow. <laughs> uh, they just, somebody just released, not to change the subject, but somebody just released the, um, a list of all the best College football team in the East State. <laughs> they had Ohio State in Michigan. <laughs> no, but it it was it was it was it was great to um to see them win and hopefully, you know, we can start to to build some momentum. Hopefully you know what I'm saying? Can. And Baker Mayfield looked really good. He looked right. really good. He was on money, he was on point. Um and so uh maybe maybe it was a, a coaching challenge or System challenge is still a new system. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for us to be in the Super Bowl this year. And if we get there, hallelujah. But, you know, I got three elders who are, are Pittsburgh fans. So they, what, done, they didn't look bad at all. 
Oh no, it looked too good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Rothos Burger was over with. I said, "Who is that dude?" <laughs> well, you know, see, and and growing up in my house, um, given that your grandfather and that entire paternal side of our family was Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, right? They, yeah, from Pennsylvania. Okay, and I mean, no, they were Pittsburgh. Okay, <laughs> and then your grandmother, and and because mommy was into football. Okay? okay, yeah. So your grandmother was straight Cleveland Browns. Okay, wow. And so that was battles in our house. So I, you know, I was a kid that grew up with with a parent on both sides. I didn't so, realize that that yeah. commercial was true. <laughs> yeah, it was true. <laughs> and, and so I never um, hated the Steelers like most Browns fans, you know, because uh, late Johnny Moore and Greg is still alive, works for the court. But you know, he he, he actually started the dog on dog pound with some other brothers before they formalized the dog pound. Right. And um, um, and so we 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 went to Pittsburgh <laughs> to the game. Mm. And you could come out in your car would be totally demolished back then. This oh, man. This is the 70s, okay? <laughs> All right. And uh, it was really funny because um, when we went to the game, I think I had something from Pittsburgh. I don't know. I might have had something. I don't know. But they didn't bother our car. Um, but, uh, yeah, that rivalry. So, you know, naturally Ray and us got a, got a, a, a wager. So uh, if Pittsburgh win, I got to wear Rothenberger. Be in Jersey. Hold on, the the first game or the series? No, the next the next game. <laughs> oh, that we played them this week. No, we play them on October eighteenth, I think. Oh, so I gotta wear the Ben jersey, and if if we win, then he gotta wear the Baker Mayfield jersey. So oh yeah, I gotta, be good. I gotta spring for a jersey so. the whole day. I don't know. We, no, we're just going to take some pictures, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna send the pictures out to the church. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, no, man, it was a great, great win. Not we not we not gonna go crazy and you know get too high, <laughs> but um, it was it was good to see OBJ get off, and I want to kill that narrative in the media. We do not need to get rid of him. Not at all. That's again, I, I'm gonna say it, whether you like it or not. Race, race, race. Yeah. All right, because he, I like all these young races. I, I just like what these young. People are doing in all the sports, whether it's Naomi Osaki. I mean, it is just powerful to see them say, hey, I play this game. I play it well, but this is who I am. Because in the past, you had to dummy down who you were. You had to conform to some Caucasian model or their perception of a model or their perception of your behavior. You just couldn't be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That, all that's gone. That's gone. Cause these owners, are, they want money more than they want culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And especially now because of the movement, that's even opened it up even more. And then the activities of LeBron and and some of the other sports, the NFL. I mean, just to hear some of the music and some of the statements being made. That's why when people say nothing has changed, they don't understand. You know, you got to see this thing for 50 or 60 years and know where we've been and how it was. I mean, when Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali and them came together to form the Economic Union, can you imagine today athletes coming together to form something like that with the wealth that they can garner? Well, now you're talking about real power because when you have the economics to go behind your politics, that's where real change occurs, as we all know. Absolutely, and that's that's been the... <clears throat> the power of the conservative movement, well funded, well financed, and strategic in their in their move about this country to make states red. Right. So on one hand, it's like you don't gotta like it, but you could take some pages from the book. No, they took the pages from our book. Or well, I'm saying at this yeah. point in time. Yeah, without a doubt, they watched that civil rights movement and how that thing worked. Their churches weren't involved like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they watched it and they learned and they they learned well. You know, and and that, I'm not angry at anyone. It's just that someone who's kind of been w- work with both groups politically and religiously, you know, it's just always been hard for me to understand how how they couldn't get it, knowing they had the power to make the biggest difference, because they are more monolithic than uh, the the liberal party, which is so diverse. It's much harder for them to be unified. Yeah. Their biggest strength is diversity, but it's also the biggest crack in their armor. <laughs> yeah, I was watching a um, an episode of Marlin on Netflix, 
And uh, it was crazy because their son was in this, like, advertising campaign for this major, like, sports company. But then they didn't know what the ad was going to be. But then they came out. They got, like, an advanced copy of what it was. And it was, like, some kind of, like, monkey. Some monkey something. <laughs> and they was like, furious. They was outraged. And then, you know, it's Marlon is crazy. But he stormed into, like, the boardroom. Went there with the owner and the whole board. He looked around like, oh. It's not even one black person in here. So it was like, <laughs> they wonder like, how could it get through all of these people and nobody even had a clue? Right. And that's how. Right. And that's how. Or you have a person, um, a black person in the room who doesn't know how to stay in the room and navigate the necessary discussion. Right. Just proud to be there and afraid to speak up. <clears throat> Haven't been, has, hasn't learned, you know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have known how to be in those discussions had I not sat in rooms with Dr. Lowry and o, Dr. Otis Moss and uh, Dr. Jesse Jackson and others who I had the privilege to sit in the room while they were directing the narrative, and because they could di- direct the narrative with great um, finesse as well as get to the place where we needed to get to to put a black agenda or black empowerment yeah. opportunity forward, and that's a skill. No. That everybody doesn't possess, and you have to really be careful that you don't allow the fact that you're led in the room to become your only goal. Yeah. Well, I've had the benefit of sitting in certain rooms with you guys, some of your uh, contemporaries, so that's been a blessing. And it makes a difference. You know, I didn't have a father who was a pastor, so um, I was there by the benevolence and grace of these men and women of God as well as the fact that Mount Sinai was significant enough to get me in places because of my predecessor, Dr. Hill, ultimately his dad, um, our pastor emeritus emeritus, uh, uh, David Weldon Hill. So because of their family, our family is benefiting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so heat up, what, 3-1, Lakers up 2-1. Lakers Heat, who you who you who you who you got going to the finals? We don't want the Lakers to go, um, but Denver's like gnats; they don't go away. Yeah, man, them young boys ain't they? <laughs> they don't run out of energy. See, <laughs> LA, LA came back and punched them, and I, you know, I thought that, but man, them them, them boys, I, you know, and 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 because they're not as noted and known as um as uh. Um, you know, the Lakers and uh but I hope the Heat wins. Um uh I liked a lot of young guys on Boston, but you know, Boston been one of my Yeah, uh, it's just a historical <laughs> Yeah, right. That's historical. Nothing against Boston per se, but historically because of the Laker battles, you know, back when I was with the Lakers when we didn't make the playoffs, you know. Yeah. Uh so yeah, I, I hope it's the Lakers and the Heat. That would be that would be Le- that would be a good one for LeBron to have to beat his former team. Got two chips with. Yeah. I definitely hope to see them win. Yeah, that would be great. And Cleveland baseball. Can't say that other word, their name. They need to fix that. But Cleveland baseball advanced to the playoffs. So we're in the playoffs. I think all three games, uh, because this is the wild card or whatever, I think mm. all, th- all three games are in the same stadium. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Definitely interested. To see well, that. I don't think there's a home field advantage because of the lack of fans, but it's still right. played in their stadium. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. Well, I think. Um, oh, hold on. <laughs> One more thing. <laughs> um, I just want to say this. Um, obviously, you know, it's still Corona season, and we got to be cautious. But I think we reached a point where um, companies can stop exploiting or <laughs> um, using COVID as an excuse to mask their uh, ineptitude. Folk, I don't know. Folks sleeping at home instead of working at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody's still using coronavirus as the excuse. We, we ordered the table, your mom and I, and so uh, the lady was uh, giving us a delivery date or something, and, you know, she was sharing, sharing some things with us, and as we were walking, she and I said, wow. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you haven't used the corona yet. <laughs> yeah. And she said, I'll come back to that. <laughs> and then, after we finished the deal, 
you know, it's scheduled for a certain time, but due to the corona, we have to tell you that it may not happen. I'm like, wow. You know, and I've just had, it has been hard to navigate these systems, you know. Earlier on, there were some, like, legitimate, like, well, I think people were actually trying early on because they wanted to make sure that the company was going to be here, my job was going to be secure. Not everybody's kind of like, eh, I'm cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I've had some clashes and, uh, you know, and again, you, you know, you have needs. You have things we got to get. We got things we're doing. We're trying to move forward on some things. And, you, can't, you know, I actually had a package come today, so it, it came rather quickly, so I'm pretty happy. Yeah. That's all I got. Uh, oh, well, just did you hear that the Pentagon spent a billion dollars that was meant for coronavirus on body armor and jet? And listen, 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 listen. All right. I go back to accountability. Yeah. The Senate <laughs> abdicated any authority they had to the president. Okay, all right. Uh, TikTok deal has to be approved by the president. <laughs> yeah, that, that's like one of the most bizarre things. <laughs> so, so we're at a period in this country that, at least in my lifetime, we haven't experienced. So we have to see how this stuff plays out because um, uh, it's, it's 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 very different. Um, and again, like I said, um, this man has delivered on everything that the conservative movement needs the court lower taxes and as soon as the court's in session and or if they don't rule by november 10th on affordable care act it's gone Mm. okay and uh ultimately the restructuring of voting will happen because the 213 213 amendment obliterated voting all right, the vote. See, the Voting Rights Act that was passed in '65. Yeah, thank you. okay. That's been under attack ever since, and it has to be amended every so many yeah, years. It still got to be approved. Okay, right. and that's why the um, uh, Johnny Lewis Voter Rights Act yes. would restore everything. So, if this president wants to stand up and say he did the most for black people, Mitch McConnell has abdicated his authority to him. Is sitting on his desk just telling Mitch, approve it. And if they approve it, that restores our voting rights fully, and they are less under siege. Now, you're going to have steel. But if he doesn't, now that you've got the court, and you got some states where folk are crazy, they got some crazy folk winning these elections. So what's the, what's the ramifications? Oh, come on. Eventually... All right, just think about it. Some places your employment checks your credit score. Right. What's the purpose of a credit score? Mm. Yeah, matter of fact, one of the out of college, I was about to get this. Um, yeah, yeah. So the ramifications, and I don't even want to speak anything into existence and be prophetic. But they're significant as far as voting. That's one of the things been under attack. Housing is another thing been under attack. All the things that were 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 gained have been eaten away with consistently for fifty years. Mm. So now, with the, the only thing protecting us was the court, and they began to rule differently twenty years ago. And now, with six out of nine conservative justices. And they're younger. Those are lifetime appointments. Yeah. And these aren't just conservative justices. These are conservative votes. Not because they're going to look at the law, but because an activist agenda has been put in place. Mm. And so now with 200 new appointees at the lower courts, they'll just be pumping stuff up to them. Yeah, and that's the part that most people are not talking about. Well, I mean, you know, come on now. Americans have to go to work. They got to take care of their, I don't care if you're black or white. got to go to work. They got to take care of their families, and they got to have some fun. So I'll be a Republican. I vote Republican. I ain't got to worry about it. I'll be a Democrat. I vote Democrat. I don't have to worry about it. 
I'm sick of both of them. I'll be independent. That's America. We abdicate our power to somebody else. Yeah. Because it's much easier for them to have to think about all this stuff. The only reason I have to think about all this stuff is because I got all these people that are part of our ministry and that follow us. But at least I got to say, here's a little truth. Right. And I've had to do that for 30 some years. I wish I could just go read sermons and preach and be like everybody else. Hey, y'all, here's the sermon. Jesus loves you. <laughs> but God didn't give me that mantle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't ask for it. Didn't want it. But maybe my parents and grandparents' activism in their own way. Um, I don't know. My pastor, you know, the people around me who were my role models. So I've, I've never had a choice, though. Every morning when I wake up, got to fight. If I'm breathing, I'm fighting. Go vote. Go vote. Thank y'all. Bam. We yeah. out of here. Till next time. God bless.